Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we revisit the Valentine's Day 2014 underground explosion and radiation leak at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. What's been happening in and around that still-closed, radioactively contaminated site meant to hold plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste? We'll find out as we check in with Don Hancock, Executive Director of Southwest Nuclear Information Center, and the first person not affiliated with either the Department of Energy or the Environmental Protection Agency to be allowed on a tour of the underground facility. Plus, we will have our ever-popular Num Nuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck, and Cover Report, Activist Shoutouts, and more honest nuclear information than can be discerned by the flip of an Iowa coin, coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, February 2nd, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Breaking news just in. The legislative push to transfer remediation authority over Westlake Landfill from the Environmental Protection Agency to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, putting the site into the Corps' formerly utilized Sites Remedial Action Program, known by the acronym FRUZRAP, has passed in the United States Senate. The bipartisan bill was proposed by Missouri's U.S. Senators Roy Blunt and Claire McCaskill. To capture the moment and what it means, I contacted two former interviewees of Nuclear Hot Seat who have been directly involved in the battle to move the Westlake cleanup from EPA to the Army Corps. First, I spoke with Byron DeLear. He lives near the Westlake landfill and has been involved in clean energy issues for many years. Byron is a columnist with Examiner.com, was founder of Global Peace Solution, and is currently running for state representative. Byron DeLear, congratulations. I hear that there has just been a major step forward in the battle to get Foosrap to take over Westlake. What just happened? This is absolutely in a way from potentially polluting sources of municipal water. I know that you expressed in the last interview we did that even that is kind of a half-measure solution, meaning this waste doesn't really have any place on the earth that it is really safe, but it certainly has no justification to be left in an uncontained fashion in the middle of a densely populated county. What can we, the listeners of Nuclear Hot Seat, do to support you in this next push with the House of Representatives? So I would just encourage the listeners, please join on Facebook. Facebook is an amazing tool for uh, social interaction and connection with these movements. These tools of the Internet and, and through the Information and Communications Revolution have an absolute way of connecting activists from all over the United States. And we see so many similarities to the issues that are faced by these communities. And Libby, in your recent interview on Coast to Coast AM on George Norrie, we heard how eloquently you spoke about all the similarities between these sites all over the United States because Nuclear Hot Seat really amplifies those issues. And so I would just encourage the listeners to go to the Westlake Landfill Facebook page. There's over 18,000 members, and that kind of operates as a central nexus through which we can mobilize people and uh, direct people to talk to their representatives and encourage them to pass House Resolution 4100 so that this community can be made whole again. That was Byron DeLear. I then spoke with Dawn Chapman. Dawn is the admin for the Westlake Landfill Facebook page and a genuine grassroots leader in this campaign for environmental justice. Dawn, I heard that there's good news out of Westlake and it has just taken place. Tell us what's going on. 
It is breaking news, literally. We just got our Senate bill, 2306, passed in the U.S. Senate by both of our senators, Senator Roy Blunt, Senator Claire McCaskill, and that bill was to transfer authority of our site, Westlake Landfill, from the authority of EPA over to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and their Foos Rat program designed to clean up Manhattan Project Waste. How does it feel to have hit this milestone in the struggle to get Foos Rat to take over the Westlake Landfill cleanup? It is very difficult to explain how it feels right now to have this milestone and have it hit this evening. When you fight for something like this and you fight so hard and you give everything that you have as a community and you band together and you get a win like this, it is just an incredibly empowering feeling. And in the middle of this nuclear disaster looming over our heads, it is just a tremendous blessing. What are you doing to celebrate, and then what do you do after the celebration? My celebration in a time like this is probably very different than other people's, honestly. I'm going to put PJs on and crawl into bed and cuddle with my dogs and watch everybody else online. I like to sit back and watch everyone else on the page and watch them get excited and feed off of their energy because they've worked so hard, and these people have been through so much. To be able to deliver good news for once is just, that's what feels amazing tonight. As of tomorrow, the battle is going to switch over to getting this passed now in the House of Representatives. Oh, it absolutely is. We have a battle ahead of us. We have to get this passed in the House. We have bipartisan support there, too. And I think my message to our Congress, our reps who are pushing forward with that bill, you know, thank you, we're behind you. And to the opposition, I would say get out of our way. We are a bunch of moms, and don't mess with our kids. Is there any message you would like to give to Nuclear Hot Seat listeners? For the Nuclear Hot Seat listeners, I know for a fact that many of you who have heard this particular show have called in. I know you guys have called your senators and you've called ours. I I know that because they've reported back to me. And they've said that this is where they have heard the information from. And from the bottom of my heart, you were part of this celebration tonight. Every email, every phone call, it mattered. And it does matter. And it will continue to matter moving forward. And I just want you to know that you are now forever part of our community. And we are grateful. That was Dawn Chapman. Dawn Byron, may you and all the activists who have been working so hard on getting our government to get a grip and take responsibility and clean up the mess that they made, the radioactive waste that they made, give yourself these moments in time to really savor what it is you have accomplished. You are an inspiration to anti-nuclear activists the world over. So have a great time tonight. Do what you can to whoop it up or just get quiet in your jammies under the covers, whatever floats your boat. And then tomorrow, let's all get cracking on whipping up support for House Bill 4100, the companion legislation that was introduced in the House in a bipartisan way by Missouri's representatives William Lacey Clay and Ann Wagner. Their phone numbers will be up on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com, under this episode, number 241. So let's see how fast we can all get this bill in front of President Obama to be signed into legislation. The people living around Westlake deserve nothing less. With this late-breaking story, which I think you'll agree is definitely worth the time taken, There's really no time for the news on this week's Nuclear Hot Seat. However, I would be remiss if I did not provide space for the one feature everyone looks forward to, and that is... Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's of the week. In the pantheon of bad ideas that Japan has tried to handle Fukushima... The underwater frozen wall to hold back groundwater was really way up there, but now Japan has outdone itself. 
because the country is considering building a network of tunnels beneath the seabed to store thousands of tons of nuclear waste. This is coming from a team of so-called experts from Japan's Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Japan already has a stockpile of some 40,000 units of vitrified nuclear waste with each of the stainless steel containers holding about 500 kilograms of radioactive material and more waste being produced every day, which says nothing about all the waste around Fukushima Daiichi. Radioactive soil from the decontamination process that are stacked in all of those decaying plastic bags, the radioactive water in tanks, all of the leftover fuel rods from the formerly functioning nuclear reactors, to say nothing of all of the debris from Fukushima itself. So the country that brought you the triple meltdown and all of the botched up attempts to deal with it is now intending to place high-level nuclear waste beneath the seismically active seabed off Japan and consider it a good idea. I mean, what could go wrong? Other than the fact that it sounds like a setup for a really bad Godzilla film. And that's why all you quote-unquote experts from Japan's Nuclear Waste Management Organization are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. And do you notice that whenever Japan refers to that large body of water to the east, they always call it the sea. They never call it the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, think they might be trying to disguise a connection You'll hear more about that possibility in today's final thought. We'll have this week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, well, my bags are packed. I'm ready to go to St. Louis for the February 20th Symposium on the Westlake Landfill, Bridgeton Landfill Fire, Coldwater Creek Radiation Contamination Mess, and so much more. I will be bringing back to you interviews with Dr. Helen Caldicott, the brave moms and other activists, several of whom you've heard interviewed on this show already. The plane ticket has been purchased, so I am in. But I need your support to cover the trip's expenses. That's because Nuclear Hot Seat operates on donations from you, the listeners. And now would be a great time for you to show your support. Give what you can. Many listeners donate the equivalent of a Starbucks coffee. Some of them do it once a month. No matter what the amount, it is all representative of the energy of belief and care you have in what we're doing here. To donate, it's easy. Just go to NuclearHotSeat.com and click on the big red Donate button. Then follow the prompts to use PayPal, your credit card, or debit card. And for the less technologically trusting, you can email me at info at NuclearHotSeat.com and I'll send you an address where you can mail your donation the old-fashioned way. Whatever you can do, it will go directly to help me get to St. Louis so that I can get the stories and bring them back to you on this show. And for that, you have my gratitude. On Valentine's Day, February 14 of 2014, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP site in Carlsbad, New Mexico, experienced what is still an unexplained event, an explosion of one of the 55-gallon drums of plutonium-contaminated nuclear weapons waste from Los Alamos National Laboratory exploded and breached containment. This accident released high levels of radiation, including plutonium and americium, and contaminated 8,000 feet of the underground. Some of it also made its way up through the ventilation stack and out into the environment before the HEPA filters were put on more than 30 minutes after the incident began. Though we the people paid for this nuke dump with our tax dollars, and we were promised that WIP would function safely for 10,000 years, it imploded 9,985 years ahead of schedule and has been closed ever since. To find out what's going on at WIP two years after this whole thing began, Nuclear Hot Seat again reached out to Don Hancock, Executive Director of the Southwest Information and Research Center, a nuclear watchdog group headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. 
Don has been a reliable source on all things WIP for this show. And once again, he does not disappoint. Don Hancock, thank you so much for joining us for Nuclear Hot Seat. You're welcome. Nice to be with you. The Department of Energy's recovery plan for WIP, dated September of 2014, called for the site to be back in operation by first quarter 2016, which is right now. How are they doing? They failed. They, in fact, admitted last uh, summer that they weren't going to meet the March date, primarily because of the incompetence of the contractor, Nuclear Waste Partnership, who really couldn't perform. Unfortunately, Nuclear Waste Partnership's reward for poor performance is to get $300 million extra in money from the taxpayers. So that's not a good thing about either the Department of Energy's functioning or Nuclear Waste Partnership. For what are they getting that money? Well, they're getting that money to do two things, basically. One is to be prepared to operate the facility. And remember, this is the contractor who less than 15 months or about 15 months after they got the contract had the facility shut down in part because of their lack of performance. The second part of the contract, which is sort of the new part of the contract, is to do the recovery, the kinds of things that are in that September 30th, uh, 2014 recovery plan. And so they're the ones who are supposed to be doing that, which includes fixing all of the problems that were identified in terms of poor safety culture, poor maintenance, uh, inadequate radiation protection, and a lot of other problems. So they say they're working on that, developing new procedures, and then changing the facility, i.e. trying to literally cover up the contamination in the underground, trying to bring on new equipment. So they have put some new equipment in the underground, trying to upgrade the ventilation system so that it can function, uh, retrain the workers so that they could work in a contaminated environment, clean up the soot from the fire from February 5th, 2014, and a variety of other things like that. So clearly, we, the taxpayers, are spending more money, but we are getting very poor performance, as I say, rather than being up and operating there behind schedule and over budget. One of the problems that I read about from last year is that with the main ventilation shaft closed because it was contaminated by plutonium and americium, there is very little air available underground in the tunnels and in the storage areas. And because of this, it limits the number of workers who can be underground and the number of pieces of equipment that can be run and used at any one time. Yes, that's correct. So in the what they call the filtration mode, in other words, the ventilation air that comes through the underground, of course, gets into contaminated area and has to be taken out through filters that are on the surface. So the air runs through the underground, through contaminated and uncontaminated areas, up the contaminated exhaust shaft and through filters to capture as much as possible of the radioactivity so that then the air that's released in the environment has little or no radioactivity. Because of the way the system was originally poorly designed more than 20 years ago, the maximum amount of air that can run through in that filtration mode is 60,000 cubic feet per minute. Before February of 2014, the ventilation system, if going full blast, could handle 425 cubic feet per minute, in other words, seven times the amount of airflow. So as a result of this lesser airflow, two things have happened. One is they're trying to upgrade the ventilation system, adding what they call an interim ventilation system that would almost double the amount of air going through the underground and through that filter system. That interim ventilation system was supposed to be operational about a year ago, about 10 months ago. It is still not operational, again, primarily because of the incompetence of the contractor and the fact that they 
didn't take care. So there were manufacturing problems with this interim ventilation system. There were shipping problems with it. When it actually got to the whip site, it couldn't be used because it was in such bad shape. So they've had to undo, redo that ventilation system and to try to put it in operation. So they're still operating. So since February 14th of 2014, they've been operating at this 60,000 cubic feet per minute area. So as you say, they're limited number of people can be in the underground and limited amounts of equipment. One of the things that they have done, and I saw this when I was the first non-governmental person to go underground on October 1st of 2015, they had some of the new equipment they've brought in are for example, a hybrid bolter. A hybrid means it can run on diesel or it can run on electricity. So because it can run on electricity for a significant period of time, they can have it in the underground. And because it's not running diesel, it doesn't need ventilation to protect the workers from diesel fumes, etc. So that's allowed them to do more bolting to try to keep the ceilings from collapsing, for example. Even though they don't have the ventilation they need, they're trying to do a little bit more because they've improved uh, some of the equipment. But they still have this basic problem. The other thing they said related to ventilation in that September 2014 recovery plan is in addition to this interim ventilation to add about 54,000 cubic feet per minute to run through the filtration, they were going to also add what they called a supplemental ventilation system, which would, for the first time, bring in fresh air and exhaust out fresh air so it wouldn't go through the contaminated area so they could have air in some of the uncontaminated parts of the mine so they could have more equipment and more workers in some of the uncontaminated part of the mine. Another thing that's happened now is because of problems with the interim ventilation system and the supplemental ventilation system, they've decided it'll be so long before they can get both of them online that they're just now trying to get the interim ventilation system online. And they're delaying even trying to get this supplemental ventilation system online. So, again, we're back to this situation because of problems with the contractor and not really knowing what they're doing, either the contractor or DOE. There still isn't adequate ventilation in the underground, and there isn't going to be even marginally good ventilation in the underground for months at least. I just have this image with the underground electrical system being run, that that must be one heck of an extension cord that they'll be using. (laughs) Be that as it may, you alluded to this before. One of the problems caused by having a limited workforce with limited time underground is that regular maintenance on these salt tunnels and rooms and storage areas has not been taking place. And in at least one instance, a section of the roof was reported to have collapsed. What is the current physical condition of the underground facility at WIP? They have done a lot of catching up on this rock bolting to put these long 10, in some cases 10, 12, 14 feet bolts up through the ceiling in the salt to stabilize it so it won't fall down. They've made a lot of progress. They say they're about 90% or more caught up. In the areas that I went into when I was underground on October 1st, they had in fact made very significant progress. That doesn't mean everything is fine. In fact, one of the main tunnels, they've done an enormous amount of rock bolting in, but the ceiling was still sagging, which I'm not a mining expert, but it doesn't mean that I felt the ceiling was imminently going to collapse. But parts of this mine are very old. They were mined 30 years ago. And, of course, one of the characteristics of salt is that salt moves or creeps. So this is a constant thing of the ceilings coming down, the floors moving up, the walls are coming in, and you've constantly got to take care of that. They have made a lot of progress, especially with using one of the former bolters and now this new hybrid bolter. As far as we know, there's only been that collapse in what was called the entryway to panel three where there was a collapse. 
They have not reported any other collapse at all. The places to be most worried about collapse are the areas that they're not rock bolting, but the areas that they're not really able to do much rock bolting are the more highly contaminated areas of the underground. But a good thing from their standpoint is the contaminated areas are also by and large the most recently mined areas and so while there's a lot of movement after you first mine they have some time to catch up at this point they profess they doe and the contractor to profess to not be concerned of any new imminent rock falls In some of the older areas where they haven't done as much rock bolting, they also don't really have people in those areas because those are contaminated areas that they're not using anymore and frankly don't plan to use anymore in the future. Speaking of the radiation levels, what is known about the levels in the contaminated area? How bad is the contamination and Do people have access wearing protective gear, or are they still prevented from going in there? One of the big problems from my standpoint and other people's standpoint is that DOE refuses to release the actual radiation documentation. In other words, they're required to be doing radiation detection on a constant level uh, with the workers that go underground into the contaminated area, yes, wearing protective equipment. They're required to have radiation technicians with them that are constantly monitoring the levels of radioactivity. There are additional what are called continuous air monitors, continuous radiation monitors in the underground that are operating. So they say that the levels are much lower than they were. They're saying some of the areas that were contaminated and used to require workers and protective equipment, you can now go, some workers can go in with lesser protective equipment because the contamination levels are less. But as I say, my organization and other people have asked constantly to get the actual details, what the exact contamination levels are, how they were measured, who measured them, how they've varied over time. We don't have that information. They've been unwilling to release it other than general maps that show some of what they consider to be the levels of of radioactivity. Early on, when we were able to get some measurements, the amounts of contamination vary two or three or more orders of magnitude, depending on where you are and how close you were to where the, the major release occurred. So we don't expect that the levels are the same every place, obviously, but we don't really have information. What they're doing in areas that they now consider to be pretty decontaminated is they have essentially covered up the contamination. They argue that most of the contamination was on the floor, so they've put bratis cloth, they've put materials down and then covered it with salt and done some painting, so they think as the floor heaves up and they start to get back to the contamination level, that will be obvious visually as well as through radiation detection and they'll be able to cover it up some more. This is an untried technique. They're very pleased with how it's operated, but as I say, it's an untried technique A. B, because they're not releasing all the radiation data that we'd like to see, we don't really know how well it's going to work and we certainly don't know how well it's going to work over days and months into the future you're going to have more buckling of the floor and likely increasing levels the other thing to say which doe doesn't dispute but doesn't like to talk about plutonium and americium the two basic radionuclides that were released are known to have what's called recoil in other words the radionuclides continue to have energy So rather than just wanting to stay in the same place, they want to move around. And again, this is a known phenomena that occurs, but they don't really want to talk about it in the sense of what are the actual uh, radiation measures so that we can see how they're varying over time. And so, for example, in some places that they think they may have somewhat decontaminated, 
They haven't done so well because of this uh, recoil activity. So there are major problems really in that way. And one of the things that was a very great concern to me is when I was at WIP on October 1st, and they made pretty much all of the top people available to me for that tour, which I appreciated, both in terms of talking on the surface and going into the underground, I asked the underground recovery manager, the person who is, for the contractor, who's responsible for the overall underground recovery. I asked him if his goal when they reopen the facilities to start handling waste is that all the workers would be able to go in any place without the protective equipment. He sort of hesitated and he said, well, yeah, that's our goal. And I said, well, I don't agree that that could or should occur. And his response was, well, that's my goal. I don't know whether we'll achieve it. The problem is we're back to this mode of that's happened too long at WIP is we want to meet schedule, we want to put waste in, we want to move waste around, and safety is not the high priority. The safety culture has been degraded over a number of years in my view. So this whole idea that you could start putting waste into the underground with workers in less than full protective equipment is a very bad idea, would not be safe, and the fact that that's even the goal is a concern to me. With the workers, 22 were confirmed to have been internally exposed to radiation from the accident, meaning plutonium and americium. What, if anything, is known about their health now that it's two years out? Essentially, nothing is known about their health. What we do know and what's been confirmed both to me personally and said in broader public context is the DOE and Nuclear Waste Partnership estimates are that each of those 22 workers received less than 10 millirems of internal exposure. They consider that to be so low that it required no medical treatment, no ongoing medical screening, no anything. And, of course, that completely negates the difference between external radiation and internal when they've inhaled or ingested it, and it's up close and personal with their internal organs. That's correct. And as we say, so from my standpoint, and more importantly, from medical professional standpoint, that's not the proper way that those workers should have been treated. Remember, some of those workers were first told that they had received no internal contamination, and then later were told that they were. But in some cases, it was more than two months after the exposure before they were even informed that they had been exposed. So in my view, the medical screening and the medical treatment of the 22 workers was wholly inadequate. But both the OE and the contractor say no further medical screening was necessary, so they're not even doing any screening of, of those workers. So we don't know what has happened to them. We don't know what their current health is. DOE and the contractors have said that all of the workers return to work, whether almost two years later all of those workers are still at work is unknown. One of the workers, we do know, one of the persons who was exposed was one of the DOE people who was the former deputy site manager. We know he's retired and he's moved away. I mean, he was not worried about his health, I know, because I've talked to him personally. The last I know, he seems to be fine. But again, as as you know and many of your listeners know, um, internal radiation exposure of things like plutonium can concentrate in the lungs, and it's not like you necessarily immediately develop symptoms of respiratory problems or lung cancers that can take, you know, years of latency to do that. So in most cases, we don't know who the workers were. They've never been identified, and we don't really know what their status is. Just so people know, less than two months ago, there was a worker found dead on the surface of the WIP site. As far as we know publicly, his death is still in the hands of the Office of Medical Investigator. All that's been said is they don't expect any kind of foul play in his death. As far as we know, this is not one of the 22 workers that had contamination. 
The impression that DOE and Nuclear Waste Partnership want to give is the fact that this worker died had nothing to do with the fire and radiation release. And hopefully that's true, but in any case, we have a dead worker, and that's a very sad situation. With the radiation having been released, what, if any, monitoring was or has been instituted for the surrounding neighborhoods, and what, if any, remediation? has taken place in the area, either on-site or off. Remember, the WIP site is a 16-square-mile site that's about 26 miles from Carlsbad. Carlsbad has 25 to 30,000 people. So there aren't people that live in very close proximity. The people who are closest to the site are the workers who come to the site and people who are on oil and gas rigs in very close proximity to the site because there is so much oil and gas production around. There is monitoring done on the site, and there's some monitoring done of the workers. There's no person-specific monitoring done of people off-site. There are air monitors that exist that DOE and the Nuclear Waste Partnership have that the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Forum, the independent group that actually first identified that there was air contamination from the February 14th event. That ongoing monitoring shows that the levels of radioactivity, plutonium and americium in the air is the same as it was before the accident. So, in other words, the monitoring showed there was some release at the time, but for now, well over a year, the air monitoring, whether it's DOE or the CMERC, Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center monitoring, shows that there's no contamination in the air that's being detected now that is from the WIP underground. From the perspective of the state of New Mexico, what has been the fallout, either in legislation or lawsuits, as a result of the accident? Because the state said, and DOE and Nuclear Works Partnership agreed, that there were numerous violations of the state's permit to allow WIP to operate. The state, in December of 2014, notified Nuclear Waste Partnership and DOE that they had numerous violations and they were going to impose fine. Within the last two weeks, DOE and the state have now agreed to what's going to be done in terms of fines. No money has actually exchanged hands yet, but there will be some money spent. I and a lot of other people were hoping the state of New Mexico would take strong enforcement action. One of the things the state has appropriately said is WIP cannot reopen until the state says it can reopen. So that's a good move. But in terms of the required changes and improvements before the facility would be allowed to be reopened, as I said, I'm disappointed with that progress. And so it's unclear how disappointed the state will be and what action, if any, the state of New Mexico will take. Now we're hearing that New Mexico is actually vying for the chance to become home to even more radioactive waste. What do you know about this? So some of the boosters from the Carlsbad area, including people related to the mayor and some of the elected officials, have for a long time been promoting what's called the Eddie Lee Energy Alliance. This is officials from the two counties, Eddie and Lee County, and officials from the two closest cities of size, Carlsbad and Hobbs, to put together this corporation to promote what's called a consolidated storage facility. So to bring over time up to all of the nation's commercial spent fuel from nuclear power plants and put it on the surface at a spot uh, a few miles away from the WIP site. So they are openly saying that they want to promote this. They're openly saying they're going to uh, apply to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a license to do this kind of facility. So, yes, there are certainly some people who are arguing to support this. This is an old idea that 
this group and other groups have had in New Mexico for more than 30 years, the large majority of the citizens of New Mexico have always strongly opposed this. We've always been able to defeat such proposals in the past. I'm confident that we will beat this proposal again if it moves forward, as I'm not actually sure it's going to. The citizens of New Mexico have always opposed high-level waste or spent nuclear fuel being in the state. We don't have any commercial nuclear power plants. We never have. The people have always thought this is unnecessary and dangerous, etc., and even a lot of people who support WIP said, you know, we'll, we'll do WIP for plutonium-contaminated waste from the nuclear weapons industry, but we won't do anything else. And in fact, insofar as some people in the state and elected officials think they consented to allowing WIP to operate, it was with the explicit caveat that that was all that would be done either at WIP or in the state. The people in the Carlsbad area never necessarily liked or agreed with that, but they've always been the minority in terms of public opinion. They still are. They are trying to pursue this, but we think we will stop it and defeat it. Don, two years on, what do you think is the true future for the WIP site? Well, I think it's very much uh, to be seen. Uh, the Department of Energy is sure they want to reopen the facility. They're going to release, presumably in the next few days, a more detailed schedule saying they want to reopen it by December of 2016. That date is, in my view, totally arbitrary and totally related to the fact that the current Secretary of Energy, Ernie Moniz, will cease to be the Secretary of Energy on January 19th of 2017. January 20th, 2017, of course, there'll be a new president and a new Secretary of Energy. So I think the, this fictitious proposed date to reopen is not going to happen, but again, it's unfortunate that that's the kind of date that's being pushed. If WIP has to be safe to operate, to have to get back to something approximating the start clean and stay clean situation it was supposed to have, it's years away from being able to do that. I certainly think that the idea should be examined of what if WIP doesn't reopen and the facility is just decommissioned with the waste that's in it, which is more than 91,000 cubic meters, no small amount of waste, and to look at what happens to the waste that still exists at various sites around the country and how they would handle it. I think that is something that needs to be looked at, but DOE at this point is unwilling to look at that. To summarize, I think during this year of 2016, there will be lots of public debate and discussion, maybe litigation and other kinds of public mobilization to say it's not safe to reopen and DOE and some other people will say, yes, we do want to reopen it and how that dispute and fight and conflict gets resolved uh, remains to be seen. I think it is very unlikely that WIP will reopen it in 2016, but I recognize the fact that the Department of Energy says that they are going to try to reopen it then. And what are your Don, your greatest frustrations and fears about this whole situation? Well, I've mentioned a couple. The fact that they won't release the actual radiation information about what the situation in the underground is. That's a great frustration because it's very important for the workers to know that information. The fact that the safety problems are great, and as I've already mentioned, the contractor to me has demonstrated that they're not competent and capable of operating the facility safely, and then they're not competent and capable of decontaminating and, and restarting the facility. That's a huge concern, and the fact that we, the taxpayers, have rewarded them effectively by giving them $300 million more than what their original contract called for is a very great frustration. The fact that the Department of Energy wants to reopen WIP but doesn't really want to say what it's reopening for, that it's reopening just for the long-term mission of plutonium-contaminated waste from nuclear weapons or whether they want to expand it to so-called surplus plutonium from nuclear bombs, bomb-grade plutonium, high-level waste from Hanford, Washington, commercial waste from commercial power plants, commercial waste from West Valley, New York, 
all of the things I just mentioned, the Department of Energy has environmental impact statements out currently saying, yes, WIP could be used for all of those things. I have great doubts about the safety of the facility, but if you're going to reopen the facility, to be able to judge the safety of it, you need to have a better idea of what waste is or isn't going to be going into it. So those are all very great frustrations and that not just I, but other people share. And that's why I say if the Department of Energy continues with this idea of getting it reopened by the end of 2016, there's going to be a lot of public debate and conflict and um, maybe litigation around that to keep that from happening. Do you feel that there's anything that we haven't covered that you would like to get in? Oh, well, there are always more things. But you've, <laughs> you've, 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 you've done a very good job of asking the questions, and I try to cover quite a bit of ground. So I think the high points that I think are important for people to kind of understand where we are and the enormous amount of progress that hasn't been made, especially compared to what we've been paying for, we the taxpayers have been paying for, I think we've explored that. And, and you've asked some very good questions about contamination and the status of the workers, et cetera. So I appreciate all of that. Well, we here at Nuclear Hot Seat appreciate you, Don. You are a wealth of information on this, on a topic that, of course, has faded from the news cycle and will receive on Valentine's Day scant mention, if any, in mainstream media. So thank you for being the resource that you are, and we will continue to be in touch with you for all updates dealing with WIP. Thank you very much, Libby. That was Don Hancock. Executive Director of the Southwest Information and Research Center, a nuclear watchdog group headquartered in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Activist shout out! I want to welcome those of you who found Nuclear Hot Seat last week through my appearance on Coast to Coast AM. As you can tell, there's a lot of nuclear information out there, and every week this show does its best to keep you up to date with enough humor and attitude to keep you from getting depressed too much. Know that there is a vast international network of activists who have been fighting nuclear fights around the world, and they have a wealth of strategies, techniques, footnotes, and support to provide you in whatever your local nuclear battles happen to be. Reactors, uranium mining waste, nuclear weapons manufacturing, improperly buried radioactive waste, and so much more, You'll find stories here, links on the website, and suggestions to where to go to get the support you need to fight back. As the lyric in the Nuclear Hot Seat theme says, the activists are linking. That now includes you. Welcome. Here's today's final thought. The Coast to Coast AM show with George Nouri that I did last week was perhaps the most intense two hours of broadcast radio I've ever participated in. I wish I could post it on the Nuclear Hot Seat site, but unfortunately, the show does not provide links. Instead, they sell memberships so that people can access their archives. Some of you are already members, and I've been told there may be bootleg copies in circulation, though I did not do that. So if you can possibly listen, please do. I think you'll get a lot out of the ride. One of the things that I got from the outpouring of support that I received in the wake of that show was from a woman who wrote me about her family's direct experience with Pacific Ocean fishing. While we do not yet have scientific proof, incontrovertible proof, that what's happening in the Pacific has any connection to the ongoing, never-ending radiation releases from Fukushima Daiichi into the ocean, It's a suspicion that ranks high on every activist's mind and has yet to be successfully contradicted or eliminated. With that in mind, I want to share the message from the email that came from Kathleen Ofheim, and I do so with her permission. She wrote, I have two grown sons that commercial fish in the Kodiak, Alaska area. Last week, Our oldest son told us some disturbing things. He told us that last summer there were a dozen or so dead whales floating in the waters on the south side of Kodiak Island, from Alitak to Cape Chiniak, and numerous dead whales in the Shelikov Straits. Last week, 
He said when he ran his boat up to a flock of rock ducks, the ducks did not fly away like they usually do. They were all dead. Also, he ran through a large school of pollock, all dead, floating with their tails above the water. Pollock is a midwater fish, harvested by trawling, but they are coming to the surface and dying. Other residents who travel between the cities of Kodiak and some of the smaller islands around have seen dead ducks too. Our younger son has been cod fishing Kodiak Island too, and he said that the codfish have sores on them. The local Alaska Department of Fish and Game biologists are telling them that the shrimp are poking them and causing the sores, which is absolutely ridiculous. The news around is that halibut are coming up from the bottom of the ocean like bags of mush. The fishermen throw those back and only keep the good ones. And the salmon have big sores on them too, and some of them are like bags of mush. Bears and sea otters are dying mysteriously from viruses or parasites too. It's terrible. I know this is hearsay because I haven't actually seen these things with my own eyes, but I believe what I hear from my sons. For four years, no fisherman would ever speak of such things, as their entire livelihood depends on a healthy fishery. Now they can see that there is no hope for them. Although my sons know about the radioactive waste flowing into the ocean, they are still fishing, but they are getting over being in denial about it. They think they may have another year of fishing, and it will be all over with. I wish they would stop now before they get sick. Most people I know will not eat fish that comes from the Pacific Ocean. Our Washington, D.C. delegation will not respond to my letters. There are millions of pounds of frozen Alaska wild fish on the market, and I believe that is because most people are refusing to eat Pacific fish. Senator Lisa Murkowski is proud that she was able to convince the Alaska School Department and Alaska Corrections Department to buy Alaska fish for the school lunch program and for the prisoners. If you look on the school lunch menu, fish is served at least three times a week. It's disgusting. It's another example of follow the money. And Murkowski's husband and sons are commercial fishermen. Thanks for listening. Kathleen Ofheim. To which Nuclear Hot Seat responds, Thank you so very much for writing, Kathleen. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, February 2, 2016. Material for this week's program in the script you did not get a chance to hear because of the Westlake breaking story, but maybe we'll catch up with it at another time has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, postbulletin.com, powerengineeringmanagement.com, forbes.com, countercurrentnews.com, eurasiareview.com, nuclearstreet.com, knoxnews.com, informable.com, oregonlive.com. i got to stop saying .com or find a way around this. Anyway, Encinitas, advocate.com, examiner.com, ccnr.org, counterpunch.org, Fukushima-Diary.com, Asahi.com, Manichi.jp, NHK World, JapanTimes.co.jp, SCMP.com, TheGuardian.com, TheHindu.com, ChinaPost.com, TransCanada.com, CTVNews.ca, Nuclear-News.net, ABC.net.au, The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community, which you are all invited to visit and like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, formerly Veterans Truth Network, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org in Boston. We're always looking for other networks and news aggregators to connect with. So if you know of one that would be interested in possibly carrying the show, do put us in touch. 
And check out the archive, everyone. It's available on the website, on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and on iTunes. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat going and growing and will help with me in St. Louis to cover the Westlake landfill disaster. So please do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Heartistry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed, as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.